We have Jeff Knoxted, that's our candidate for the industrialization position. Jeff is currently an assistant professor at the University of Arkansas, and he received his PhD degree from Washington State University in 2013. Jeff has been working in the area, areas of international <coughs> trade, industrialization, agriculture policy, econometrics, and he has published in various IT economy, economy, and other journals. And then he has taught classes in international trade, agriculture policy, principles of microeconomics. And then this that, I have a question. Okay, so um, thanks for coming to the seminar. I'm, I'm going to start by talking about some of the work I'm currently working on and some of my future plans, just so everybody kind of knows um, what I'm doing in addition to my job or in addition to the seminar. Um, so in terms of the area of industrial organization, I currently received a grant, an AFRI grant of about $400,000 to look at the processed food industry. So in this grant, we're interested in looking at <coughs> transatlantic trade and investment partnership. That's what today's seminar is going to be on. Uh, we're also interested in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So these are large trade agreements that are very likely to come into effect. Um, so how does that impact processed food industry? I'm interested in the U.S. Uh, beer industry, how have policies and consumer preferences over the last um, several years kind of really led to the explosion of the microbrewery industry. Um, so in there, there's likely some very large oligopoly players, the large beer industries, and then there's a lot of um, monopolistic competition at the lower end in terms of the different microbreweries. Um, I'm also interested in seeing how some of these large trade agreements are going to impact multinational firms. Are we going to see an increase in multinational firms, increase in their volume? Um, so that's one thing I'm interested in looking at. I've also been working on analyzing the recent farm bill and specifically to crop insurance. Um, so with the new farm bill, there have been fairly substantial changes in um, farm policy and they've been kind of moving towards mitigating risk through different crop insurance options. So the first study that I worked on was um, in the wheat industry and we specifically looked at, we used Mitchell County as kind of our um, in Kansas as our kind of representative county that we study. Um, I've taken this model and we've expanded it to look at uh, firm heterogeneity, so how does different sizes impact uh, policy payments and how farmers make decisions. I'm currently extending that into the cotton industry, which has some slightly different uh, policies that are available there. Another area I've been working on is uh, immigration, and I have another AFRI grant to work on that. Um, so I'm interested in kind of looking at some of the economic motives for um, immigrants to uh, cross from Mexico into the U.S., and how do different policies that have been implemented, how do they change those decisions and economic motives to uh, cross the border? And I'm also interested in kind of developing a dynamic general equilibrium model uh, of the U.S. and Mexico, Mexican immigration. Um, a lot of the immigrants that are entering enter into labor-intensive agriculture with the intention of using that as a stepping stone into other industries. Um, so different policies that uh, influence the number of workers in immigration can influence other uh, sectors in that economy, so we're interested in modeling some of those uh, um, paths from Mexico to the U.S. and then into agriculture and then out of agriculture. So that's kind of an overview of some of the work I'm currently working on and some of my uh, future plans. So with that, I'd like to get into the impact of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership uh, on processed food under monopolistic competition and firm heterogeneity. So this is joint work with uh, Stephen Zavagos. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to, just a brief outline, I'll introduce, uh, introduce the paper in question, we'll look at the model, 
uh, talk about some simulation and results, and then conclude the paper. So I've, I believe there's a handout that's been passed around that has uh, the model summarized in it, so that may, that may help as we go through that section. And feel free to ask questions, uh, any clarifying points or any questions as I move forward. So the processed food industry is an important part of the agricultural food supply chain. It's one of the parts of the supply chain that's actually seen a fairly substantial increase in exports over the last 20 years. We see about 178% increase between 1998 and 2012. Um, the processed food industry is also has some interesting uh, features that aren't in other primary agricultural uh, sectors. Um, so these firms are going to be gauging a mon monopolistic competition and they produce highly differentiated firms. So in this paper when we're talking about the processed food industry, we're talking about the entire food industry. So we're looking at, so we're including things like uh, microbreweries and beer, we're including uh, processed meats and cheeses, and you know, different cereals. Um, so firms differ quite a bit in size. And we have very small breweries that serve just a one region or area, and we have large firms like Kraft. So we have you know, a, a very wide variety of different firm sizes and a very wide variety of products that are produced. So there are many firms that operate only domestically and then some that decide to export. So we're going to be able to see how different trade policies implement or impact this decision to operate domestically or to export. Um, and then the US and EU are actively negotiating a large trade agreement and this could potentially reduce trade barriers such as tariffs and non-tariff barriers. Um, and when this is implemented, this is going to you know, enhance market access for both U.S. exporters and EU exporters in each other's countries. So when we talk about world trade in the processed food industry, the U.S. and the EU are uh, by far the largest players in this market. They account for almost a third of total global trade. We have EU exports uh, the most of any region or country and their value, the value of their exports around $97 billion, whereas U.S. exports around $51 billion. Now in terms of imports, uh, the U.S. and EU are much closer. We see that the EU is importing about $57 billion, whereas the U.S. is importing $61 billion. So these are you know, a very substantial amount of trade that's going on here. And on top of that, the U.S. and EU are the largest bilateral trading partners. Um, so this is largely due to similar tastes and preferences and you know, traditional trade links. Um, the U.S. and the EU have kind of always been major trading partners. So in terms of bilateral trade, the EU exports to the U.S. are about 16 and a half billion, whereas uh, EU imports are worth 5.1 billion. So the EU is exporting more to the US than the US is exporting to the EU. Okay, so another thing that um, is going on is tariffs themselves are not terribly large in this sector. We see a trade weighted average of about 14% uh, for products entering the EU, whereas the US is about 3.3%. But what is substantial in this industry and in a lot of agriculture is non-tariff barriers. Uh, and this is different from many other manufacturing sectors. So the food processing industry has sanitary phytosanitary standards that have to be met. Um, and one thing that's happened over the years as trade barriers have been lowered, the non-tariff barriers have been implemented to kind of act as trade barriers. So, the current estimates right now are that the EU imposes about a 56 or 57 percent additional cost on processed foods entering the country, whereas the U.S. has about a 73 percent additional cost. 
Um, so the question is, are these non-tariff barriers in place to protect consumers, or are they protect the producers? If they're there to protect the producers, then that's um, just a trade barrier that probably needs to be eliminated. So one thing that the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership is going to do is going to eliminate those tariffs. And reasonably, it could reduce the non-tariff barriers by about 50%. <coughs> Reducing them by much more than 50% is not very realistic. Um, but if we align some of our measures, we could reduce these costs by about half. Yes? How, how did you calculate those at Valorian to go into the MPVs? These have already been calculated. I have citations and a couple slides on where we got these numbers from. So they use a gravity model to calculate that or estimate it. So the added blame equivalents are about 57 and 73%. <coughs> So we can see some substantial gains that could be uh, gotten by the implementation of TTIP and reducing those trade barriers. Okay, so the, develop, or the objective of this study is to develop a multi-region trade model that accounts for some of these features in this industry, specifically the monopolistic competition, uh, the differences in firm sizes, and how they make their operating decisions. Do they operate domestically or do they export? So we'll calibrate the model to the EU and US food sectors and then simulate the effects of the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership. So we're interested in how does TTIP impact prices, consumption, the number of firms, productivity, and welfare. Now the modeling that we use allows us to look at how this impacts firms that are operating, and we can even look at some productivity measures. So without the monopolistic competition trade model with heterogeneous firms, those are two things that, these are two things that we actually can't look at. We can't get any idea on how TTIP will impact. So that's one thing this modeling brings in that we can try and get a sense for how this is going to affect. So a lot of what the studies have done in terms of the processed food industry and TTIP is they'll look at one specific segment of the processed food industry. So they'll look at like processed meats, for example, or they'll look at the dairy industry and see how TTIP might impact the dairy industry. Um, so this is we're trying to look uh, get a bigger or a broader picture, and we're also trying to account for some of the market structure that goes on. A lot of the studies, previous studies, have not accounted for these. Uh, different and important um, market structure, market structures that exist. Okay, so the model setup, we're going to have a three region model, we're going to have US, EU, and the rest of the world, uh, and we're going to allow for differences in preferences across countries, differences in technology across countries, differences in sizes, and then we're going to add trade policies. Um, so when we start adding for these differences across countries and technology and region sizes, the model is actually not able to be solved analytically. Um, but there's been some papers that have made some simplifying assumptions and gotten comparative statics results. So those already exist in the literature. And when you complicate the model by allowing for these differences, there's no longer an analytic solution. So we're going to solve it numerically. Okay, so I'm going to start by discussing uh, the consumer side of the problem, and then we'll look at producer side. We'll then look, talk about the equilibrium. Um, and the equilibrium will close the model, we'll be able to solve that, but we're also interested in some additional statistics and aggregates, so we'll then define some aggregates after we define the equilibrium. Okay, so for this paper we're going to assume Dixit Stiglitz preferences. So what we're going to have is the consumption of goods produced in region M consumed in region I for good Z. So Z is going to index different goods within a region. Now, since we're assuming Dixit-Stiglitz preferences and uh, monopolistic competition, 
each good z is going to be produced by one firm. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between z and the <coughs> firm. So that z is also going to index the number of firms, and it's specifically going to index the firm productivity. So we can connect our productivity z to a specific firm that produces one specific good. So z is going to index the good that's produced in m and consumed in i. So what we have here in the utility function is the integral of c i m, and that's basically just adding up all the goods that could possibly be produced. Now we don't know ex ante which goods will be produced, we have to weigh it by some probability that that could largely be produced. So the integral is just summing up all the goods, <coughs> and then we have a z-bar measure that's going to be the cutoff productivity, but no goods below z-bar will be produced. And we'll be able to identify exactly what z-bar is. So anything below z-bar is not produced, anything above z-bar is produced, so that gives us a lower bound on our integration. So you can think of inside the integral is just summing up over all goods, and then we sum up over each region. So CII is going to be goods produced in the U.S., sold in the U.S. CJI could be goods produced in Europe, sold in the U.S. And CKI is going to be goods produced in the rest of the world that are sold in the U.S. So we're going to sum up over all the goods, and then we sum over the regions. Now we have our budget constraint. The second line, again, we're going to just price times the price of the good times the good summed up over all goods, and then summed over all the regions. So we're summing up the goods produced in the U.S., sold in the U.S., produced the goods produced in Europe, sold in the U.S., and the goods produced in the rest of the world, sold in the U.S. We sum them all up, and that's going to be the cost. And that has to be less than income. So here we're just assuming that income is exogenous. It's just the amount of money that is spent on processed goods. Now, the productivity, we're going to assume Pareto. This is fairly standard in the uh, trade literature. Uh, and this is a distribution that has a location and a shape parameter. So this distribution is basically going to say that you have a high chance of being a low productivity firm, a very low chance of being a highly productive firm. And if we look at the trade data, that's consistent with a lot of the trade data. There's only a very small percentage of firms that actually do export. Most of the firms are small and choose not to export. So remember, this is connecting a firm's productivity with the goods. So Z is going to be, again, the productivity of a firm. And there's going to be one firm that produces one good. So Z also indexes the number of goods that are available. So that one-to-one -one connection by assuming monopolistic competition and it's a thing of preference. I think the key is the monopolistic competition here, though. That makes the connection between one firm and one good. Okay, so maximization of the utility function subject to the budget constraint leads to the demand function, and it's a function of income, some price index, and the price of the good, and then demand parameters. So the price index is going to be, again, just a weighted average of all prices of all goods for goods consumed within a region. So again, this basically sums up all the prices uh, of the good using some consumer parameters, and then we sum over all goods consumed in a region. So we have demand function price index. The next we'll look at <coughs> the producer's problem. So again, there's going to be a continuum of producers that produce, each produce a different variety indexed by productivity parameter C. Now we have a fairly standard production function. Price times production is going to give revenue. And we have variable costs, which is some input price times a composite good, minus fixed costs. And here we're assuming fixed costs are paid in terms of the composite input. So they both have the same price. So we have a variable and an input that are all paid in terms of the same, the same good. 
fairly simple but standard production function. We have the productivity times the composite input weighted by trade costs. The trade cost is divided into transportation costs, tariffs, and non-tariff barriers. So it's fairly simple but standard in the trade literature to make sure that these models are fairly easy to solve and not don't get out of hand too quickly. So maximization of the profit function subject to the demand function. So that's an important thing here is the demand function gets plugged in for either Y or P, whether or not you invert the demand function or not. It doesn't matter in this case whether or not you plug in for the inverse demand or the regular demand function. Because we have um, each firm basically acts as a monopoly for its own good. So when firms act as monopoly, it doesn't matter if you do Bertrand or Cornell. So both will give you the same solution. And I can show the math on that, but it's not really relevant here. So anyway, so this gives us our pricing rule. So if we look at the pricing rule, we have the input price times the trade cost divided by the productivity parameter. That's going to give us our marginal cost. Now the markup over marginal cost is going to be one over row. This row parameter is um, part of the utility function. And that's going to be the elasticity of substitution. So how much you can mark up the price of your good over your marginal cost will depend on the elasticity of substitution, how consumers can substitute from your good into another good, how easily they can do that. So if you produce a very unique processed food item, and it's very difficult for consumers to substitute away from that, you're going to be able to charge a larger markup. Okay, so that's the consumer and producer side of the problem. Next, we have to look at how firms decide whether or not they're going to operate. And that's going to help us identify our cutoff productivity level. So hopefully this is not terribly surprising. A firm only operates if it earns non-negative profits. So if you have a productivity, a productivity draw below Z bar, then you're going to earn negative profits. You're not going to operate. If you get a productivity where you draw exactly at Z bar, you're going to earn zero profits. If you get a productivity draw above Z bar, you're going to be making positive. So the most productive firms are going to be making positive profits. Uh, the least productive, productive firm or the marginal firm is going to make zero profits. And where that zero profit condition is at that productivity level is going to identify where, what, what type of goods are going to be produced. So any good that's produced below Z bar again will not exist. So the zero profit condition identifies the cutoff productivity level. And then we have some relatively standard market clearing conditions. So consumption of good I, of good produced in I, consumed in N for good Z, is going to be exact, exactly equal to the production. So this is that one-to-one -one connection between production and consumption. One good is consumed. So each firm produces one good, each consumer consumes that one, or they consume that one good. We also have an input clearing for the input market. So since the fixed costs are paid in terms of the composite input, that shows up in the market clearing condition. For inputs, again, we sum over all goods and then sum over all regions. So the fixed cost for producing domestically the fixed cost for exporting to Europe, and the fixed cost to exporting to the rest of the world. And then we have our variable inputs to production. It's going to be equal to the, the composite input supply. And here we just have a scale and an elasticity. <coughs> so with these two market clearing conditions, the price of each good is endogenous to the model, and the input price is also endogenous to the model. So this is enough for us to solve the model 
numerically. We can put all of these equations on the computer with a little bit of reducing and actually solve the model. But we're interested in actually looking at some statistics that we can use to evaluate how the economy is performing. So that's what we're going to look at next. So are there any questions on the model part and the closure before uh, we go forward? So first, when you talk about monopolistic competition, on the, the rule for the firm, you have a, you have a condition, right? Mm -hmm. So I just couldn't see what's the difference between that condition with, because in general, if it's a monopoly, then there's a, there's a condition in terms of price and market, right? right? But this one is monopolistic competition. So right. which condition do we have to guarantee this is a monopolistic competition rather than a general monopoly? So this pricing rule, right. if we were just looking at monopolies, Z wouldn't be there. It would just be one large firm that's mm -hmm. producing everything. Mm -hmm. So if you are a less productive firm, you're not going to be able to charge as high of a price for a different good. So that's one thing that comes into play. And it has to do with the demand function. So if you are uh, efficient enough, so you will be able to produce and supply. Yeah. And then so there's basically there's an infinite number of firms in this model right. that are each a monopoly in their own good. So in a non round the profit for each firm should be it is not zero in not this case. Why? So the only firm that is earning zero profits is the least productive firm. Uh -huh. And then every firm above that can actually earn positive profits. Right. But if the standard definition for monopolistic competition is kind of like each firm is kind of unique, has the power over the product, mm -hmm. but in the long run, and then all the firm will see, yes, no, it's not positive profit, other firm will keep coming, keep coming until right. the, so, the profit is actually zero. So that has an implication on. So in this model, N is going to be the measure of firms. Uh -huh. Firms in the and, alpha market. Yeah, so N is going to be, so in this model, N is going to be the number of firms that can, let's go back here, is the measure of firms that can potentially enter. Okay. Now, are you saying there are some there's going areas to be, for entry? Yeah, and then there's going to, the number of firms that actually operate is going to be a subset of this. Okay. Now, because we ran into numerous corner solutions mm -hmm. that we couldn't get around, we actually had to simplify the model. And in the original version, this was endogenous. That would lead to a zero profit condition for everybody. Okay. So because this is held exogenous, uh -huh then that zero profit condition isn't part of the model. Yeah, okay. So that zero profit condition is what you're talking about, and that right. would lead to zero profits right. in the aggregate. Right. But we are holding this exogenous, just there's just some fixed number of firms that could potentially enter. Uh -huh. And then this condition here identifies that subset that actually do operate. So you actually assuming there's an entry barrier. So yeah. There will be uh, so the firms actually earn positive profit. Yeah. So it's uh, different from the standard monopolistic competition. Yeah, and slightly the, different in that respect. Right, and you're not modeling the entry and exit of the firm. You just assume that... So there's, there's a key distinction between an operating decision and entry and exit. Mm -hmm. An operating decision is going to be whether or not you choose to operate or whether or not you do something else. Entry and exit would be the change in... I think of entry and exit as a change in the number of firms that could potentially enter. <coughs> but you're not modeling it. But we're not modeling that. We run into... And the benefit of not modeling it and assume that's kind of exogenous, the benefit is help you can find the yeah, we, solution. It kind of helps you get away from the corner solutions. We couldn't actually find a solution that worked when we had that variable monogamous. So we had to fix it. We ran into numerous corner solutions. <laughs> so it's it's unfortunate that we had to make that assumption, but that's really an underlying assumption of this paper. I think I go into detail on that in the paper, but I'm kind of maybe glossing over it here.
Yes. Do you have different uh, fixed costs for operating in the domestic market and then for exporting, or you are assuming? Yeah, so this is the profit function for a firm that is producing an M and selling an I. So for instance, if you want to produce domestically, that would be II. So you'd have, a, you'd have to pay a fixed cost to produce domestically. Right. And then if you want to export to Europe, that's an additional fixed cost you have to pay. So we sum over profits to get total profits. So you sum over your domestic profits, the profits from exporting to Europe, and the profits from exporting to the rest of the world. And there's a fixed cost for each one of those steps. And those, okay, so those buy uh, by location. So probably yes. the fixed cost of entering the Japanese market is different than the Yeah, so that's, if if we included more regions, then there would be a fixed cost for entering the Japanese market. Those are really costs of establishing those trade connections and making sure all the customs and sanitary and phytosanitary standards are met. Okay, are, do, are you, do you have some sort of a slope to them? Are they endogenous in the model? That, 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 like the model they export? are not endogenous. Okay. They'll, they'll be calibrated, but then once they're calibrated, they're fixed. Okay. Um, and the last question, could you provide a bit of intuition on the, uh, on the parameters of the, of the Pareto distribution of the film? Yeah. Uh, what are, I, I guess that that's what's capturing the film heterogeneity, right? Yeah, it would be nice if I could draw it. Um, can we move this up yeah, for a second? Can, if you want to whack the screen. I would do that. Uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 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 oh, oh. Let's see if there's... Oh, yeah, there's I can probably just draw on this one. This is good. So if we have productivity on the x-axis and I'm going to use G. G is Z on the vertical axis. So this is the probability density and this is the productivity parameter. The Pareto distribution is going to have some asymptote at the um, scale. Let me just make sure I use the right notation. So the location is going to be mu. So it's going to have an asymptote at mu. Each region has its own mu. And it's going to look, it's going to look something like that. So it has an asymptote at mu and then the x-axis. So you have high probability of being an inefficient firm. So the odds of being getting a low draw in an inefficient firm is very high. The probability of being a very productive firm is very low. And this is consistent with uh, most of the data. The data says, you know, there's a huge mass of firms that are small, that operate only domestically, and then there's a small mass of firms that export into the region. So you have to be the most productive, the most efficient firm for exporting to be profitable. And the odds of you being that productive firm is very low. That, does that answer your question? It's kind of a weird distribution, but this is fairly standard in trade literature anymore. So I guess, uh, can you go back to your G of Z, uh, the, the film heterogeneity, uh, the, the one that we raised at previous slide? Right, so alpha sub i, uh, that will be, so that the shape of your Pareto, arguably, will be different for different uses, right? Yeah, so, so the alpha parameter is going to dictate the shape. The higher alpha means that it's going to be even closer to the asymptote and you're going to have a higher chance of being 
So if this parameter dictates the shape, yeah. higher alpha means the mass is cl even closer to that asymptote. There's more mass at that asymptote. So you're more likely to be a less per productive firm than a more productive firm. Okay, so this gives us model closure. So in terms of a real income index, the uh, nice thing about this at Stiglitz is that gives us, the utility function just gives us real income. So we can use that as a welfare measure directly. So we're going to have C as our real income index. And we're going to want to look at some aggregate production measure. So again, we sum over each good, and we sum over goods sold in each region. That just gives us total production. And in a minute, I'm going to redefine this uh, in a different way to look at our productivity measure. But it's, I'm going to be looking at the Y I M to get the productivity measure. So we again, we have a composite input used. This is sum over all goods that are actually in production. And then sum over the regions. But here we're just looking at the LIM instead of the LI. So I need this to look at my to get my productivity index. And then this kind of comes back to your your point. Um, so this is how we actually identify the measure firms that actually do operate. So the CDF. Uh, evaluated at Z bar is going to give us the percentage of firms that don't operate. So 1 minus that gives us the percentage of firms that do operate. So we can look at the subset of firms that can potentially enter, uh, enter as the ones that actually are operating. Now there's, uh, again, if we didn't run into those corner solution problems, we could have also made this endogenous, and that would have been an aggregate zero profit condition. So on average, all firms make zero profits. But we were not able to do that because of numeric difficulties. Right, so it's kind of, for me, it's like, um, so your some firm choose not to operate, mm -hmm. but the firm that choose to operate, actually, they are earning positive profit. Yeah. So you can see, if I'm not uh, yeah, yeah. operating, but I see a positive profit, why, should, why couldn't I get in, right? Even I'm not as efficient as the other one. But you have to be lucky enough to get a good draw to make positive profit. But if, if your distribution of your productivity continues at a cutoff, mm -hmm. I would just say a little bit less efficient as the other marginal firm, and he's actually earning positive profit. Right. But I decide not to get it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not, I mean, there is that issue, um, but everything I've read is making that aggregate zero profit condition. Right. That's all sorts of numeric difficulties. You, you may want to kind of to have a paragraph of something to say if we go in that direction how yeah. that will affect my results. I think, okay, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. That's actually a comment that one of my other colleagues gave me. Okay. <laughs> Same comment. <laughs> um, so we can see here that there's an inverse relationship between the cutoff productivity and the number of firms that operate. The cutoff productivity increases there's going to be fewer firms operating. Yes. Jeff, you keep saying the cutoff on productivity. Uh, I'm struggling to make a connection between that and the motivation between non territory barriers. So, mm -hmm. is there any endogeneity of the presence or magnifying of non territory barriers on what you're viewing as productivity? Yeah, so. Where is that? Z is just going to be a grid of numbers between zero and infinity. So we want to see how the change in the trade barrier impacts the Z bar. <coughs> if Z bar goes up, the number of firms that are operating is going to go down. And the, the trade barriers are going to influence the cost of production. Right? Lower trade barriers can be lower cost of production, which is going to make less efficient firms profitable. Is a good that's produced compliant with a non-tariff trade barrier different than a good that's produced 
non-compliant. Well, there's two different goods here. Not in this model. Um, basically, all goods are going to be subject to some additional trade costs. Yeah. So where I'm struggling, and forgive me if I'm being naive, but I partially follow this. If you have one firm that's producing two goods, because it's not one firm, one good, you just told me, all right? It should be one firm, one good. Well, then they're not the same. Then they're two different goods in that story. If it's one firm, one good, I mean, that's what I'm struggling with, is if now I face this non-tariff trade barrier and I used to export to the U.S., mm -hmm. now you make me do something different, do I just stop exporting, or do I redefine myself as a new firm producing a new good and then keep exporting? Those aren't the same thing. You are going to be the same firm that may now no longer export. But if you're going to be lowering trade barriers, you're going to get more firms exporting. So you were a firm that only produced domestically, trade barriers go down, now it's profitable for you to export. So there's going to be more firms that are going to engage in the export market as a result of lower trade barriers. Yeah, that, I mean, that story is in where we reduce the barriers given what we're already doing. I'm yeah. not sure it matches the same as if the reverse, and now we add more non-tariff trade barriers, so which is what's been happening over time. So if we added trade barriers, XIM, so U.S. firms exporting to Europe, that was profitable for them. And if we add trade barriers, that may no longer be profitable. So they drop the IM and only produce for II. Okay. So they only produce domestically, but it's still the same good. They can either produce one good, sell it domestically, and export that good, um, or they can produce the good and sell it domestically. Yeah, but they never chose to change the production itself in that story, right? That's changing the direction of where the product is. Yeah, I mean, the production yeah. function is okay. specific to a location. Okay, thank you. So basically you just shut down the export part of your production and only operate domestically. Okay, so we've, we have some type of aggregate measure for production and input, variable input use. And we've looked at the measure of operating firms. <clears throat> so how do we get to a productivity index? Um, so we can redefine production IM in this form. It just takes a little bit of algebra. Uh, not too bad. So we basically say average productivity times average composite input use times the number of firms that actually operate weighted by the tariff is going to be equal to this production level. So it's not very difficult to show that. And then we can look at <coughs> ZIM as basically an average, weighted average of productivities that are currently operating. So this gives us a productivity index. And then to get an index measure for one producing region, we do a weighted average based on the number of operating firms. So if there's very few firms exporting, then that productivity gets a lower weight. So just do a, basically it's just a weighted average. So this is based, I mean, you can just think of this as average productivity and then a weighted average for each firm that's either, or for production that's being sold domestically and exported. We're really interested in how reduction of trade barriers impact productivity. And if we can be more efficient, that's always a good thing. If it leads to less efficient production, then that's not necessarily a good thing. And we can look at that in concurrence with total production and consumer utility. Yeah, if I think I got lost. Yeah. Yeah. Why are you indexing Z by N to uh, on, the, on the aggregate? Yeah, the weighted average. Um, uh, can you uh, one one slide right there? So that's the productivity of a firm in country I. So this is an aggregate productivity measure. But what's, what's ZIM there? That's where I got lost. Yeah. So ZIM is going to be okay. an average productivity measure for all firms that operate 
in I and selling M. I see. Okay. So this is going to be basically average production for domestic firms if it's II. And then we have another average productivity for exporting firms, IM. Okay. And then we're going to take a weighted average of those. So what you can see with this is uh, like if you have some changes in the fixed cost in these non trade barriers, how this ZI is going to yeah. change? Is that okay? Yeah. I mean, we calculate these, but we're really interested in the aggregate measure. Mm -hmm. Because most likely there's going to be positive and negatives here, depending on if you're a domestic firm or an export firm, but what happens in the aggregate. Mm -hmm. um, so you can think about it basically if inefficient firms exit, this is going to go up. If inefficient firms enter, this is going to go down. Does the gain? And the plus outweigh the minus. So that's why we're interested in this aggregate one. OK, so we can reduce the equations into three equations that we look at in equilibrium. So we'll look at the zero profit, labor clearing, and price index. We can reduce all the other equations down, specifically the demand function, profit equation, production technology, pricing rule, and the market output market clearing. So we can condense all these things into these three equations. And this gives us a system of 15 equations and 15 endogenous variables. So Z bar IM is going to be 9, 3 for the US, producing domestically, exporting to Europe, and exporting to the rest of the world, 3 for Europe, and then 3 for the rest of the world. There's going to be three intermediate input prices and three aggregate price indices. So to calibrate the model, our main data source is going to be the GTAP 9 database, sectors 19 to 26. Um, those sectors just basically account for all aggregate production of processed foods. From this database, we're able to get domestic production inputs, imports, <coughs> exports, transportation costs, and tariffs. So our non-tariff barrier information comes from Burden and Dean. They basically just use a uh, gravity model to estimate the non-tariff barriers, any, uh, the bilateral non-tariff barriers. Um, here we have to make some assumptions. This might actually be a good place for empirical work in the future. There's not actually any estimates on what the elasticity of substitution is for each of these regions um, for the aggregate processed food industry. So we're going to assume 2.3 for the US and EU and 1.4 for the rest of the world. This basically just means that there's a higher degree of substitutability in the US than in the rest of the world. Um, and there's no estimates on the elasticity of supply, so we're just going to assume 0.5. Seems fairly reasonable. For our Pareto shape parameters, we're going to assume 3 for US and EU and 6 for the rest of the world. This is going to imply that the probability of being a productive firm is greater in the US and the EU than the rest of the world. So you have a better chance of being productive in the US than you do in the rest of the world. And then we're going to just normalize the measure of firms that can potentially operate to 1. So then the firms that do operate is going to be some number between 0, 1, and just represent a percentage. So given that data, we're going to calibrate fixed cost, credo scale, and the scale parameter on the input supply. So given the data and the parameters, <laughs> We can make those calibrations, and that will fit the model nicely to the data. So our baseline simulation is going to replicate the GTAP9 database. So in the paper, we consider three alternate scenarios. The first one is the complete T-tip scenario where we eliminate tariffs and reduce NTV barriers, and then we break out 
uh, tariffs and NTVs separately. Uh, for the sake of presentation, I'm just going to eliminate, or I'm just going to discuss the most important and most interesting case. It's the complete implementation of TTIP. These are discussed in detail in the paper, and if um, you want to know more about it, we can discuss that with some as well. Okay. So I'm just including these numbers just to, as a reminder of what uh, the level of uh, trade barriers were. So if we eliminate tariffs and reduce the NTBs by 50%, we get this bilateral trade matrix. So going down, we're going to have imports. So US imports from itself, US imports from the EU, US imports from the rest of the world. EU imports from the US, from itself, and the rest of the world. Going across is going to give us exports. So US exports to itself, US exports to the EU, and US exports to the rest of the world. So looking at this, um, I don't think anything is terribly shocking. We see that reducing the trade barriers has a substantial increase in exports, and that's going to reduce domestic production. So it's cheaper to export, so exports are going to go up, domestic production is going to go down, the rest of the world is relatively more expensive than the, R or than the EU, so U.S. imports from the ROW are going to very similar story in the EU. Imports from the US go up. Uh, sales to itself are going to go down. And sales from the rest of the world are going to go down. Now, these numbers are larger than what I have seen in other papers. So the first thing to keep in mind is this is the first paper I've seen that looks at the aggregate processed food industry, <coughs> and the first paper to account for the market structure. Yeah. So that's going to have an important effect on the magnitude of the results. And these aren't the same because the EU has different income um, and slightly different production parameters. So it's not just going to be a one-to-one -one, um, increase U.S. exports increase the U.S. Board. so they're not quite exactly the same. Now in the rest of the world, the U.S. finds it more profitable to export to the EU, so exports to the rest of the world go down. The EU finds it more profitable to export to the rest of the world, to the U.S., so exports to the rest of the world go down. And since the rest of the world exports are decreasing, that's going to increase domestic production a little bit. So they're going to stop exporting to the U.S. and EU, and it's going to try and sell some of that in the U.S. Or, sorry, in the rest of the world market. So here we look at the measure or the cutoff productivity and the measure of operating firms. So again, if you remember back to the equation, there's an inverse relationship between these two parameters or these two variables. So we see in a, for the U.S. firms that are selling to itself, operating domestically, we see that the cutoff productivity increases. So you have to be a more productive firm now to operate in the U.S. And this is largely because you're now competing with EU firms. You're competing with a larger set of goods and potentially more productive firms from the EU. So the minimum cutoff productivity to operate domestically goes up. This implies the measure of firms that actually do operate goes down. So we're going to see, I hesitate to call it exit, but you can kind of think of it as exit. These are firms that no longer operate in the processed food market. Um, we see that for U.S. firms exporting to the EU, the cutoff productivity goes down. This implies the number of firms that are operating is going to go up. So trade barriers go down, trade costs go down. It's now more profitable to export to the EU. So the minimum productivity required to actually export to the EU goes down, and the number of firms that actually do export goes up. And then because it's relatively more expensive to export to the 
rest of the world than to the EU. We're going to see an increase in the cutoff productivity for firms exporting to the rest of the world. They're going to reduce the number of firms exporting to the rest of the world. Now, most likely, these firms are going to switch from the rest of the world to the EU. It's going to be more profitable to export to the EU. Now, in the European Union, we see uh, a very similar story as to what we saw in the U.S. market. Um, cutoff productivity to export to the U.S. goes down, so you don't have to be quite as productive to actually export, and that's going to lead to an increase in the number of firms that are exporting to the U.S. Um, we're going to see an increase in the cutoff productivity for firms operating in the uh, EU, so selling to themselves. And this is because, again, they're competing with more productive U.S. firms on a larger set of goods. So there's more goods, more varieties available to the consumers, and you're competing with more efficient firms. So you have to be more productive, more profitable to continue to operate. And then we see a decrease in the number of firms. Uh, similarly, the rest of the world firms exporting to the EU, and now they're competing with more U.S. firms. Their trade barriers didn't change, so they're relatively more expensive. So they have to be more productive to export to the EU. And that's going to reduce the number of firms. Now in the rest of the world, their export markets are less profitable because they're competing with a larger set of goods with more productive firms. So they need a higher productivity in order to operate. But to operate and sell to themselves, it's now a little bit more profitable to sell to yourself. So that's going to lead to a decrease in the cost of productivity increase in the number of firms that operate in the rest of the world, and a decrease in the number of firms that export. Sorry, that's a decrease in the number of U.S. firms that export to the rest of the world, because they're transitioning to EU exports. Okay. So, for example, for U.S. and EU, if they are exporting, the cut of productivity is lower, right? If they are sending domestically, the cut of productivity is higher. Yeah. What about in general? In general, together, if a firm decides to upgrade, decide to either produce for domestically or export. So in this model, if you export, we're also assuming you produce domestically. Okay. So you don't just export. You're going to sell domestically and export. Mm -hmm. So you can think of this as this increasing is going to get rid of the least, the most inefficient firms in the market. These are going to be Anything below Z bar is at or below Z bar is going to be the most inefficient firms. So they don't uh, export. Once you hit a certain threshold, now you're productive enough to start exporting. So, and then we can say overall, if we have a trade agreement, actually we have fewer firms in both US and European Union to, in this market. Yeah, that's actually something that might be worth looking into a little bit more. So this is just based on bilateral, but what about total? Mm -hmm. That's actually a good question. I don't have. Okay, so this is since we've normalized n i j to one. This is a twenty one percent decrease, and a twenty four percent, and then a four percent. So it's most likely we're going to have a net decrease in the number of firms. But that might be something to actually have calculated ready to go. So I think in the U.S. we're going to get a net decline. In the EU that may be the opposite. The rest of the world that may be the opposite. But it matters where Z-bar, whether or not you're exporting to the rest of the world lies in that distribution. So that may not actually not be the case. That's yeah, that's a that's a good point. Something I probably need to have on the slides. Because <coughs> this is a percent change, the number of firms here is going to be much larger than the number of firms here. So these percentages just don't add up. Okay. So these two results, again, are we can get these because of the market structure and the setup of the model. It's just a standard perfect competition trade model. We can't look at these.
we can't get at these results. It's much harder to. Okay, so our aggregate measures. We see here that the aggregate price index in all three regions declines. So goods overall are cheaper. We see that welfare in all three regions increases. So bilateral trade agreement between US and EU is actually better than the rest of the world. This is largely going to come through this price index decline. So goods are going to be cheaper. In the US and EU, they're going to have a larger set of goods to choose from. This is kind of the love of variety um, measure. So we have more goods to choose from, cheaper prices. That's going to be good for consumers. In the rest of the world, it's mainly just cheaper prices. They're likely going to have a smaller set of goods that they can consume. Aggregate production, we see in the US, aggregate production goes up. So the increase in exports to the European Union offset the decline in domestic production and offset the decline in exports to the rest of the world. Same in the European Union. In the rest of the world, that's a different story. The decline in exports to the US and EU does not offset the increase in domestic production. So we see a net decline in the rest of the world. And our aggregate productivity index, we see are positive for all three regions. So all three regions are actually more efficient as a result. So that's because inefficient firms are going to be exiting. When inefficient firms exit, the overall productivity of the in industry increases. Okay, so in summary, aggregate prices in all three regions decline. This was something that I actually was not necessarily expecting. I was expecting the rest of the world to be made worse off as a result of this um, bilateral trade agreement. And utility increases in all three regions. Uh, the lowering trade barriers increases the competition. So now you have to be more productive, you have to be more efficient to compete. And that's particularly true in the domestic markets. Domestic firms are now competing with more imports from the rest of the world, more imports from more efficient firms. <laughs> Uh, utility increases in all three regions, but we don't see a production increase in all three regions. So the gain in utility is coming from a reduction in prices in the rest of the world. And then, probably terribly not surprising, bilateral trade flows between US and EU go up. So that's the end of the seminar. Um, I'll be happy to take questions on current and future research or anything related to the seminar here. Yes. So the utility is not going to be thinking about the exporters. Okay. We're thinking about consumers only. Um, the exporters are definitely made worse off. Right, they lose. They're losing sales. Mm -hmm. But the, in absolute numbers, these are fairly small compared to this. So definitely, the domestic or the producers in the rest of the world are made worse off. but we're going to see downward pressure on the price index. So the price of goods in the rest of the world are going to go down. And that's going to be the main driver of why utility is going to increase. So we're being up because of the tariffs from the other countries where they were exporting to, and since they're not... We're, what do you mean by bringing like, up? Like um, the prices. Because they're importing less and they're exporting less, right? Because of this trade reduction in yes. the trade area. I think she's asking why the prices are lower in the rest of the world. So if aggregate production increases overall, that's going to put downward pressure on the market. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be really what's driving this decline in the prices. Have you thought about doing kind of a, a complete a welfare decomposition? I think that that's 
what, what I know. So, uh, I guess that we have some terms of trade effects there that prices are changing because right. of the globalization. Uh, we are, we are for sure also have allocative efficiency changes, which probably you are having the allocation of, I don't remember if you have labor as a factor, but something should be moving from the sectors that are not enjoying the, the, the tariff reduction. Right. And then you have the big new channel here that are big changes in productivity. Mm -hmm. You have a shift of those production functions. <coughs> Uh, because, well, you are, you do trade costs are low, right? Yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. So, so that, I think that that would help you to be some kind of yeah. question quite a bit. I point. agree. Yeah. So in a true general equilibrium model, where consumers are getting the income from production, then the real income index <coughs> is the one and only ut welfare utility. So changes in income or changes in um, profits from the trade barriers are going to be captured in that through the income effects. But that's not that's not part of this model because we hold I exogenous. I is not endogenous in the model. It's just the amount of income spent. So yeah, I think I agree. We need to maybe think about the, the welfare measure. We're not necessarily taking in the, the lost producers in this in this um, real income index here. So that may actually make it go negative if we account for the effect of producers. Or you could have the rest of the world being better off just because it's more productive, even though yeah. it's exporting less and so forth. And, and, and yeah, so it's, yeah. A, it's an intriguing finding. Yeah, so I think we need to think about the welfare a little bit more, I agree, because in a true GE model, this would be the one welfare effect, but because we're not capturing the income as these trade barriers changes in the income side. That's not going to be a true welfare measure. Yes? Yeah, how might these numbers change if you added in US, EU, the countries that are signatory to the Trans Pacific Trade mm -hmm. Agreement, China perhaps, and the rest of the world? That's what we're working on. <laughs> um, So if we look at TTIP and TPP together, is that what you're asking? Right, yeah. These are definitely, I think they're going to be reduced a little bit. These numbers aren't going to be quite as large because we're going to, we now have more outlets. There's going to be you know, trade barriers were going down all over the world. So we can now you know, export to the EU, we can export to TTIP countries. And so there's just going to be more uh, Possibilities. So the actual number of exports to the EU will probably be less. So this may be overinflated by not accounting for TTIP at the same time, but most likely they won't be implemented at the same time. But that was still, I mean, that's really what our work is, kind of the direction we're going. Um, the one issue is with three countries, it's a I can reduce it down to a 15 by 15 system. Mm -hmm. you know, that just explodes every country, every, every region or country. Um, so it gets very big very quickly. But that's what we want to do. Well, there's also the question of how big is the agribusiness or the food industry shipments between the US and Asia as yeah. opposed to manufacturing services and the other sectors? Yeah. So those are all things we'll look at and get the numbers on. But I think it, I, when we wrote the grant to do the processed food industry, the Asian market was actually growing considerably faster than the EU market. So that's an, going to be an important sector, or a part, important part of this sector in the, in the near future. So as the middle class in Asia rises, I mean that's where all gains in um, demand are going to be. Yes. Um, I was wondering. Did you what was the justifications for using the elasticity terms that you used and the shape parameters? Yeah, so that's and, a good question. And was it sensitive to results sensitive to those decisions? So we may, we're basically just making assumptions here on what we think is reasonable. There's not any good estimates on what these are in the literature. Um, I think this is maybe a good avenue for some empirical research to be done, so we can actually maybe tie some of these down a little bit better. Okay. Now in terms of sensitivity, <laughs> I mean, yeah, if we increase 
and decrease these parameters. I mean, it does impact the results, but I don't think it impacts a great deal. Um, I mean, I tried several different ones, and we think that these kind of are the set that makes the most sense. Um, but sensitivity analysis could be an important part of the paper, but as you can see, we have quite a few parameters, so I could write a book on sensitivity analysis of this model. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, another question it, that um, you know, we have a struggle with in, in, a, in a similar context is the choice of uh, products, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, so you're assuming here monopolistic competition, but yeah. uh, say wind, beef, yeah. poultry, these are much closer to monopolies where you have one yeah. or two firms. So how will you, and these are like the key potential winners in particular with this yeah. agreement. So, how would we go about uh, uh, you know, adapting that much more uh, uh, monopolistic market structure to a model like this? Yeah, so that's um, something we've talked about in extent, and you know, further extensions. We want to not only look at the aggregate food process sector, we also want to look at important segments of the processed food sector, so like the meat sector, the dairy sector. Um, and that would definitely require a different market structure. We have to think about the market structure in a different way. When we think about processed food as a whole, monopolistic competition seems to make sense. Um, but those definitely different, those sub-sectors are going to be different. Like what I looked at, for my dissertation, we looked at the processed juice industry between U.S. and Brazil and how um, a reduction in trade barriers could impact those. We used oligopolistic competition in that context. So, um, and I think in a first paper, I actually estimated this oligopolistic competition even makes sense. We found out yes, so then we did some more analysis on that. Um, so yeah, when you look at subsectors, you definitely have to think more about the market structure, and you can't just use the same model to do the same thing. Yeah, and you know, an idea for the sensitivity analysis, um, so there is a clear relationship between sigma and alpha that is derived from, from the fact that I guess that alpha always have to be larger than sigma. Um, yeah, there's some definitely some restrictions on the parameters. I don't remember off the top yeah. of my head. So what you could do is to fix the elasticity of substitution mm -hmm. at one point, and there are very good estimates for those, um, mm -hmm. uh, particularly for, uh, at the, you know, in the, with the data that you're working with. And then allow that shape parameter to move in that range to mm -hmm. see where the model breaks. Okay, yeah. And I'll give you a range. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that that's what that Nick was referring to. Uh, you know, are these are we flipping signs um, yeah. in the productivity change, for example? Okay. Uh, that's an idea for me. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good idea. It's a good suggestion. Definitely. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Jeff for the seminar.